and I want to introduce our Professor Stippleman, Stephen Stippleman. He is a professor um, from the Fashion Design of Art um, and has been with the school since 1993. Professionally, his career goes back more than 40 years. His first job was staff illustrator for Henry Bendel, one of the most fashion forward stores of the period. <clears throat> all the newspaper and promotional ads for them. And in his next job, and perhaps the one he is most associated with, he was an illustrator for Women's Wear Daily, and W for more than 25 years. He illustrated major American and European collections, designer to couture. He worked with these designers, often sketching the garments before they were ever made. He learned a great deal of how collections were created, as well as construction and fabrication. Stephen's work has been printed internationally, and some of his clients include Lord & Taylor, Marshall Field, Estee Lauder, Orlane, East Saint Laurent Cosmetics, Bill Blass, Pierre Cardin, Christian Dior, Valentino, uh, Tule, Bas Blasport, Basile, and Ralph Rucci. His work has appeared in many shows and exhibitions throughout the country. In 2007, he had a one-person exhibi exhibition, a theory Ethereal Elegance at the Museum of FOT, and he is the author of a textbook illustrating fashion concepts of creation. He would describe his work as being an impressive movement through the spontaneity of brush strokes and process of acrylic or watercolor. He wants his figures to always have this ethereal and swan like look as if they were floating across the page. The drawing should project an emotion um, rather than wanting someone to look the way that the drawing was. <laughs> So with that, um, Stephen, I want to turn it over to you. And oh, in class, I just want to also note we are doing class a little bit differently today. Um, he, because what he wanted to do in class was to show you guys his works of art. Um, so a lot of what he's going to be doing is holding that up to the camera. It's not going to be an interview format the same way that we usually do. Um, and I think it's going to be a really uh, great, great experience. I also just want to note that, um, you know, in this class, we're going through different types of career paths that you can take. And while some of you may be here and deciding that you're falling love, in love with the design aspect of work, the work here, some of you may think that you're really falling in love with the drawing aspect. And I think that's what um, Professor Sippelman is really representing for us here today. So, Stephen, I'll turn it over Ready. to you. Hello. This is my first online class ever. <laughs> so. Do you hear me? Yes. Do <clears throat> you hear me? Yes. Okay. Could, and students, can you just tell me, is, is he showing up as the main image when he's no, talking? No, just that photograph is showing up. Is it gone I'm now? On the no. No. And uh, Jenny. One Hi, second. <laughs> okay, now who do you see? You. I see you and see. Professor okay. Stephen. Am I on? I think yeah, I know. You're on, yes, you're on, Professor. Go ahead. Okay. Um, if I think if I don't talk, it will be Stephen. Can I um, just ask you one question? I'm going to always be in the bottom, right? I think so. Because, because, um, okay. I think so. Okay. Maybe if I make you the moderator, you won't be. Yeah. No, exactly. because if I hold something up, it'll be easier for me to see it. Whatever you want to do. And yeah. Nee, um, nee, would you mind? or all students if you unless you're speaking mute yourself so that Stephen will show up as the main I think all right look just before um, we start I see is that clear three people on top and then two on the bottom I think whoever is the host will be on the top because you're holding this lecture so you're on top I think that's how it works could you see the drawing yes okay because that's how I'm yes. gonna have to do a lot of it okay and I also see another student. Hi, B. <laughs> so if you are not speaking, just mute yourself. I think whoever's speaking will show up on the top box. At least that's the way Zoom works, so I'm, I'm assuming it's similar. <laughs> so I'm fine, right? Yes. OK. <laughs> you look great, Professor. <laughs> well, it took all day. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. OK. So should I start? Or are we going to start with questions, or should I just start? I think let's kick off with you, and we'll end with okay. some questions. So as I'm sitting here now, I'm trying to think back to when I started to work in women's wear, and God knows it was like 40 years ago, at least. Um, we could never have done this, okay? It was a world with no cell phones, no computers, no iPhone cameras, nothing. And um, the way the work had to be done then 
it's almost prehistoric to the way it has to be done now. Because part of the big thing in that period was that fashion didn't hit you right in the face. Now there's a show at Dior, two minutes later, you could see the show. What we did then, they wanted to hold back. They wanted to tease you a little bit. So before a collection would happen, um, there would just be a thing called tendency sketches. And it would be something more like a silhouette. I'm gonna show you all this as I go on. It would be a, a silhouette just to get you a little bit fascinated by what's gonna happen. Then at the collection, the only photographers that were allowed were newspaper photographers and probably people that worked for the particular design house. Everything else had to be sketched. So <clears throat> the first thing I'm gonna show you is one of the sketchbooks. I only saved three of them in my whole life. And what happened was this. I had to, let me just, it's falling apart. Wait, give me one second, okay. I had to literally sketch while, while the fashion show was going on. So as the models walked down the runway, I had to do a sketch. And I couldn't say, could you stop? Okay, so I figured out a way of doing it. And like when you ride a bicycle, you could see how rough this is. The can minute you, I see- Can you just hold them up a little slower? Like, oh yeah, no problem, longer. no problem. Perfect. You guys is more for me, okay? Yeah. Um, so what I would do is I would look at the garment that was on the stage and draw the one that just left. Don't ask me how it started to work. And if you look, I, I would write things like sometimes it would say 6DB and I'd make one dot and meant <clears throat> six double breasted buttons. And this was probably the best training I ever had in my life. And here you could see sometimes it went so fast that I had to do two on a page. And this is when, and then sometimes it went even faster, okay where I had to do three on a page. And they had to be done with marker. And it did two things to me. First of all, the, <clears throat> the most important thing it did for me was teach me it has to be done. That's the end of it. You have no choice. And I was sitting in an audience and these were gonna be the first pieces of art that were gonna be, that were gonna be shown in the newspaper and very often that was the first sketch anybody in the world saw of the garment. So it was pretty scary, but I knew the minute that marker touched the white paper, I had to do it and there was no excuse. Okay, so it taught me to think fast. The way it affected my artwork was probably the greatest thing in the whole world, far better than anything, because it made me see what was important. So I had two seconds to look at a garment at most, and I really had to see what was important. And I couldn't see anything that didn't matter. So, <clears throat> the, you know, the first thing obviously, well, it wasn't even about the color then, because <clears throat> we everything was black and white at that point. But the first thing was, what's the shape? What is the first thing my eye sees? I had to get the shape. Then what did I see? The next thing I saw was the big collar. Then what did I see? The ruffle and then she was gone. So I didn't see a little bust dart. I didn't see an elbow dart. Uh, when I had to draw, I didn't see nostrils. I didn't see ears. I just learned how to see an entire look and get that whole look down as simple, as fast as I possibly could. And it, it that influenced me for my whole life. And in my teaching, even to this day, and some of my students are here, I make them write down before they start to draw, I make them write down three things. What's the most important thing on the garment? The second, and often the third doesn't matter. And then the addition now, of course, we didn't have then. It didn't matter if it was hot pink or orange because uh, it was gonna be in black and white. So I would be sitting in one place, sometimes the editor would be sitting next to me, and Sometimes we were not even together. And it was very interesting. That was one part, but this is what was really interesting. I was really young. I was, oh, I don't even know, maybe 23, 22 years old when I became part of this world. And this was a world that was really scary to me. It, it intimidated me 
it was a world that I never experienced in my whole life. And I remember sitting through certain fashion shows and I was at the, I'll talk about how I was at the change of all this, which is what made it fabulous for me. So I remember sitting at a Chanel show. It was so quiet that you could hear people breathing. And the models walked down one at a time, holding a number. And then there would be the woman running the show who would call out the number in three or four languages. And it was like sitting at a funeral with walking models. And it was really so intimidating to me. As time went on, the show started to change, like Yves Saint Laurent. It was not the classic fashion show, like Chanel and Dior were. It, it started to change, it got hipper, it got more of the moment. Because don't forget, at this time now, we're approaching the middle 60s and the elegant world of Balenciaga and Audrey Hepburn and Jackie Kennedy. That was on this side, plus all the other society women that you just could be nameless, named forever. And the world was changing. There was an upheaval. There, it was the middle 60s. It was the Beatles. It was micro miniskirts. And what was happening is fashion shows were changing. And from all that dead silence, the music started. And then the there was mu more music and more music and more music. And with the designers that were really avant-garde at that time, like Courage and, and Cardin, and Angaro, the music even became louder. So in a short period of time, this was in Europe, you would see the shows going through the most formal show like Chanel to Pierre Cardin, which was almost, it was out of the couture house. It was almost, it was in an event place, whatever you'd call it, it's not quite as big as now, but it would be more like the way fashion show is done now with five models coming out at a time five models dancing out at a time, and some of them would be men. And all that this did to me was train me more than anything in the world could have ever trained me, because I had to learn how to see what was important and not let anything else get in the way. So that was kind of the way we worked at the most tense. In this country, it was a little bit a drop easier because when I was at Women's Wear, the, the star of Women's Wear, and the 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 most important influence of my life was um was Kenneth Wall Block, and he got to see the really bigger shows. I came in as more like a baby, so I got to see the lower, the next level down shows, which I was very happy about because the next level down was the designers that were more my age and the world of their clothes was much more what I was in tune to. Kenneth was, could have been my father easily, and he was much more from the Balenciaga world. I, my idea of a Balenciaga was just a photograph. And over the years, I've seen clothes at exhibits. So I began to work with the, with the younger designers, Jacques Tifot, Chester Weinberg, Jeffrey Bean, who was younger, the older, younger. But the clothes became a little bit more what my aesthetic was about. And I found it a little bit easier to, to draw. And be, the thing that would happen before a show, and again, these are the most important things that have helped me professionally much more, I'm not saying anything about school because I'm a professor, but much more than anything you can ever learn in a classroom. We would go up to the shows and we would, it would be called a preview. And it would be like a day or two before the show and I would go with an editor and um, I, she would ask the questions, obviously, like what is your collection about? Um, what's the color story? The basic questions you would ask any fashion designer. But fashion designers have their own language. And sometimes their words, instead of notch collar and set in sleeve, were divine and marvelous. And they, what's a marvelous collar? What's a divine shape? I mean, no one knows. So I would watch as they move their hands. And I try always to t t tell my class this, I watch the way they move their hands over their body. And all I tried to do rather than listen to them was draw what their hands did. And it became so easy for me after like about 10 years where I could distinguish between fitted, very fitted, super fitted, 
just by how much they pressed into their body and puffed, more puffed, more puffed, more puffed. And it became like I invented my own language and it became as if, because I saw no clothes yet. So it became as if the designer and myself were having a conversation in a language that never even existed. And I would try to make the lines that they were doing on their body, I tried to articulate them on the paper. Well, after that, we might see one or two pieces of clothing. Sometimes after that, much more in this country, they would send photographs to the editor of the collection, and then the drawings would be drawn from the photograph. That was the second way I drew. The third way, and I'm going to show you examples as we go. The third way, and that was actually my most favorite because it, I loved it, was seeing nothing. Okay, and what would happen, it would be a designer scribble, you know, and the designers were not that trained. So their croaky sketch was not that uh, easy to figure out. But what was good about their not training is they, they, because they had no drawing skill, every mark they put down had to be exactly the right exaggeration because they didn't have the subtlety of drawing. So sometimes it actually helped me understand what they were putting down. The big thing was, and this is why, I mean, if some of my students are here, I've said it 10,000 times, that it's very important to watch fashion shows. And I would say one or two or three a week because you learn how to see a whole collection and it's living and it's moving and you see how the colors flow and how the shapes flow. And it's the greatest learning thing in the world because if you're looking at a photograph, a photograph is dead. If you're looking at a fashion show, the garment is living. So I had to know, and I was always fascinated with the history of fashion. So before I would do a sketch, I had to know what is the look of this designer. Okay, the great designers had a look. So if it was going to be, let's say I was drawing a Balenciaga, I knew it wasn't going to look like Cardan. If I was drawing a Ralph Lauren, I knew it was not going to look like a Comme de Garçon, who didn't even exist then. But the thing is, I knew where I was going. So when I saw the sketch and when I saw the fabric, I knew where I was going. And I'm going to show you examples of this after. It got to a point where a lot of the work I got was this kind of work. And I was very lucky to, you know, during the Reagan administration, when Nancy Reagan was a total clothes horse and during uh, Prince Charles's wedding, all the socialites were dressing up as much as could be. So I would then go up to the designer and it might be Adolfo, it might be Bill Blast, it might have been Oscar de la Renta. And they, I'd go with an editor and on a dress form, there would be a blouse and it would be a wrap, a surplus, blouse that tied at the waist and it would be in a black and white polka dot. So the designers would say to me, <clears throat> all right, <clears throat> this is a blouse that Mrs. Bloomingdale had ordered, but for the inaugural, we're going to do this down to the floor in gold lame with a slit up the side. The bow's going to be bigger. It's going to have a cascade down and it's going to be two flowers at the shoulder because we're taking the other shoulder off. Okay. And I am sitting there and it was almost like, I don't know what it was like. I was in my own world and I really was able to get this and they would look at it and then they'd say, oh yeah, that's what it's going to look like. Then I would go back to women's wear and they would, and I love, this was my favorite part of the job. They would have photographs of the woman. So I would go back, they would have the photographs ready. And I literally had to take my sketch look at the photograph, do a drawing. And for 20 years, people thought I went to all these parties and I barely went to any of them. And the ones I did go to, I'd have to sketch at the parties. So that was the fabulous part of the job. The rest of the job involved working in a studio. It was just like a big loft with brilliantly talented people. And everyone had a thing they were able to do. Um, and an area that they did very well. And from that, we would sometimes we would go out to the market 
after the big shows and they would show us the garment and we would draw the garment then come back and just draw it up to the paper. I also learned about deadlines, that there was no such thing as a deadline, <laughs> basically. There were no deadlines. The deadline was the minute they gave it to you. And it was scary because in school, you know, like I even I tell my students, so if you don't hand it in and don't take this the wrong way, you get marked down. In the real world, you have no job. <laughs> so when they said they need it right away, I thought they said, okay, right away. I didn't know they meant right away. And the first big feature I ever had to do was, it was huge. And I oh got, I think I was still living at home. I was just there maybe six months. And the art director said, oh, Jackie Onassis went to Italy and she bought this Valentino coat and we need a sketch of it for the cover and it was my first big f cover page thing so he said you have to do this coat and here's a, the designer sketch and it, i remember it was white wool gabardine i could draw the coat now and he's gave me uh, it was a valentino and he gave me a photograph of her and he said this is for tomorrow's paper and now i'm a nervous wreck so as i'm a nervous wreck he gives me eight more sketches and he said, this is going to be the inside. And I'm looking at him, what? And he said, yeah, we need eight more sketches. Well, I stayed there the whole night. Actually, I pretty much, I don't even know if I went home. And I had one on the cover, and I thought that was enough to kill someone. Now I had eight more. And you know why they came out? Because they had to come out. There's, it's a certain thing, and I think it's the most important thing a student could know is the word has to, not maybe, has to. And I'll tell you a funny story and then I'll move on. This, some of my students had heard this story. I, the second time I went to the collections, I knew some of the people that worked there, you know, the ones that were my age. And we had an appointment at Dior the next day. It was a Sunday night and I was staying in a very fancy hotel that it was just too fancy for me. And I didn't even realize that you can have someone wake you up in the morning. So before I left, we were going out and all the clubs were opening. And before I left, I set everything up, my clothes, my pad, my markers, my shoes, my socks, everything, because you had to be dressed. I mean, with everything else, you had to be dressed up. Okay, okay. now we go out and as you would all understand, uh, we had a little bit too much to drink and a little too much partying. And I forgot that I was even not home. And I went back to my hotel and it had shutters on the door, on the window. And it was pitch black and the phone rings. And I answered the phone and he says, this is John Fairchild. And then it took me a second because I overdid the wine. It took me a second to realize, wait, I'm not even home. And I said, where are you? And he said, I'm at Dior, we're waiting for you. And all I remember was looking at my toes in the bed. And I said, I'm dead, there's nothing I could do. So I got out of the bed, I said, I'll be right there. And fortunately, I didn't realize fashion shows were always late. <laughs> okay, that was what saved me. So I got out of the bed, I got dressed backwards, like according to where my clothes were, like socks, shoes, pants, what the last thing I put on was my shirt and I shaved and I cut myself. And when you cut yourself, which I have never done since then, you can't really stop the bleeding. So now I'm putting tissues all over my face, like wet. I'm running out of the hotel, screaming, get me a taxi. I get into a cab, I finish getting dressed, I get to Dior. And when I got into the cab, the cab driver gave me a very funny look. And I thought maybe because, I don't know, I look like I just woke up. So I get to Dior. I can't even breathe. I'm so scared. And I'm looking for John Fairchild, who owned the paper. And he was the most powerful person to me ever in fashion. I mean, way more than Anna Winter. He owned it. And um, I couldn't find him. So I said, okay, that's good. And... <laughs> they were passing around champagne. And I said, what the hell? 
and I had two more glasses because I figured I'm being fired anyway. What, what difference does this whole thing matter? Then I meet him, and this is just as a reason for this. And we go into this room, and there are 12 models, and I'm going to do the first sketches that are going to be printed in this country. And my head is splitting, and the models are there. And it was really exciting because they did have sheets on them, like you kind of see in old movies, so that you couldn't see the clothes. Wow. And they stood in front of me one at a time, and they opened the sheet, and they were the most complex clothes I have ever seen. Layers on layers, all the new skirt lengths. And all I remember, and this is what, if you take anything away from this whole thing, this is it. I picked up my marker. I put it to the paper. I said, please, God, let this work. And I did 12 drawings. And they were actually some of my best drawings. I don't recommend it. But the reason <laughs> being, I, make it a little I had no choice. <laughs> I had no choice. And then I finally met John Fairchild at the end. He didn't even know this was going to happen. And when I got out of the door, it was the first time my life I almost fainted. So the funny part of the story, my hotel was around the corner from Dior. And the cab driver took me all over Paris. And that's why he looked at me funny. So everything I set up to now, I'm going to now show you visuals. So it's like learn there's no deadline. Because the deadline is the minute they give it to you. Learn that you could do your best work under pressure. Time is the worst thing for me. There are certain things you can't beat a dress fast, but um, pressure sometimes works for people. So instead of panicking, embrace it. You have no other choice. And accidents sometimes turn into something that could be very good. And all of this was you know, the first part of my life and the second part that went along with it is I began teaching when I was about 24 years old and um, it was a big number year, I guess, for me. And I taught at Parsons for a little while and then I'm at FIT now for a long time. And what I love about it is I'm able to, because what I did did not exist. There's a handful of people, you know, I think I'm probably the oldest in the sandfall and then maybe 10 years younger than me that really lived in this world. And um, there are techniques I know, there are stories I have, there are ways of approaching things. And I love to bring that into my class. And it's like a way of, it's, it's almost like you, it's never going to die because you're always handing it over to another generation. And in the last two weeks, my students paid me back for everything because they got me on Blackboard. They fixed everything up. They showed me how to do everything. So that was basically what my career was about. And I did a lot of other work, but that was basically my woman's wear. There, wouldn't, there was nothing but a pencil. You know, there were no photographs, nothing. So that was my best training. Uh, you know, I could take some questions now and then I'll do the rest. I'll show them stuff. However you want to do it. Um, yeah, does anyone have any questions they want to chime in with? We'll so then I could maybe explain it. <clears throat> five, ten questions. And then, um, Chiwan Jin. I have to turn on my wireless. Can you hear me? Yeah, we yeah, hear I, you. I, I, I hear you. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, my question is, uh, we know you are very experienced over 40 years. And uh, you still have to draw every day and practice every day to maintain your skills. Oh, you don't have to do anything now. <laughs> no, the only time you have nothing to do is when you die. And we don't even know that. I draw, you know, and not only, you know, the drawing every day is, is like, well, now at this term, I have more advanced classes, but it's, it's, a, it's a different thing. It's a classroom kind of drawing. But a few friends and myself, we still draw every Friday night from a model. And you have to remember one thing. I might have been working 40 years, but when I started, I was exactly the same place you were. So, you know, you never stop. And that's the thing. You know, a lot of, if you're not passionate about this, if you don't want this, 
whatever you want to do, you all might be in merchandising, you might be in 50,000 other related areas, but if you start to see it as a job rather than a passion, not good, not good. So my another question is, is there something new in today you want to really work on it based on the fashion drawing? Because it, it's different generation now, there's a lot of things new and then compare with when you started your well, career. Well, what I'd like to do is probably do some drawings on a on a, an iPad and that'll probably take me 20 more years because I'm not used to it. Um, because I'm not used to it, my hand, the touch is not the same. But a lot of students are working on a computer and the only this is all I tell them, a computer is an art supply and that's all it is. It's no different than watercolor, it's no different than marker, it's no different than pencil. It's an art supply. If you don't have the background and the knowledge and the skill, it's worthless. You don't say computer draw, you don't say sewing machine make coat. You have to know it. And I'm the firmest believer of thorough, thorough, thorough foundation. You have to learn your craft. And anything else you do is just... I, some of my students do the most beautiful rendering on a computer. It's new to me, but it looks great. It's the same thing, but they still need the basic skill of the drawing before they begin. It never ends. It just changes. Yes, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Timothy Lee, did you have a question? No. Anyone else? Um, I have a question. Hi. Hi. Is that Michelle? <coughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Um, would you say that your drawing aesthetic changed from all the jobs you've done, like throughout the years? Well, that's okay. So I'm gonna uh, thank you for that question because that's what you're gonna see as I'm gonna show you work. Your work has to change. If you're living, your work has to change. If you're stuck and dated, you're dead. And that's the end of it. And that's the whole thing with the student. When they tell me, this is my style. How sad is that at 17, you've ended your life? You know, is that your style? So I tell them, think of when you were eight years old and you had to wear this horrible outfit to a wedding that your mother wanted you to wear and you hated it, uh, but you thought it was beautiful, rather you thought it was beautiful. And I said, okay, I'm freezing you right now. That's your style. It would have ended at eight years old. Style comes with living. We all have a certain aesthetic, but it has to change. If it doesn't change, what's the purpose? Someone is going to say, I love your work. And if it was 10 years ago, we could have hired you. I mean, that makes no sense. What the word that changes is techniques. So technique is what you're doing it in. So if I draw in a marker and watercolor and pencil, that has to fit the mood. And when I show you some of the drawings and I've put them in chronological order, you could see that the thing I had to do was make my artwork relevant to the period that I was in at that moment. So does that make sense? Change, constant. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah. You have to grow. Otherwise, you could stop right now. It doesn't matter what you do. Um, so, Timothy Lee, I think you have your hand up. Yeah, sorry, I was having problems with my microphone. No worries, we, we can hear you now. Um, so, similar to what you said, um, I guess, riffing off of uh, your answer from just now, still, like, as you said, like, your style changes, there's something that's, like, very, um, I guess, uh, there's, like, an essence to every illustrator, I feel. Um, like, Kenneth Paul Block, Antonio Lopez, all those guys have very distinct styles. And I feel like whenever I draw something, it comes out looking very derivative. Um, okay. <laughs> so what, what would you say, like, would make, like, how would you recommend to stylize in a good way? And what would you think would be a bad way to stylize? Great question. Okay. When you're a student, your work will be derivative. I hope it's always derivative from a high level instead of something that's bad. I was so influenced by Kenneth Paul Block. And to this day, if even you could always see it was there. The next generation after me 
was more influenced by Antonio. The next one was more influenced by Matt. The ones before me, Boucher and Eric. You have to be influenced. The first influence that you have is your teacher. We're your student. So you're going to take from what you're learning. My answer to that is don't think about it. Because as you develop, it changes. Does, does that make sense? You're learning. When you're in school, you're learning. So if you're watching me do a demo on how to draw something, you're watching me. So you're, you're, you're learning the way I do it. Then you're going to get another teacher. You're watching them. They do it differently. Then you're getting 10 more teachers doing it differently. What starts to happen as you get older? I don't mean as well as you get older and you start you know you start a career you start taking from everything that you learn and then everything that you learn becomes yours and I don't think that's a question sometimes when a student will say oh someone said my work looks like the teacher my answer to that is thank god you had a good teacher but the thing is um it has to, but but the other part, there's an instinctiveness. There's like if I look at my work, even that I did in my high school yearbook, there's a vision that I probably had by something that influenced me. And yes, it could have been the beautiful clothes that uh, that were for before my time. They could have been the clothes that were in my time. They could have been artists that came before me, designers that came before me. The, but it just grows by itself. I think there's, there's always a reason um, that you're attracted to something or not attracted to something. And you have to let it grow. And I don't think you should be, I don't think you should be spending time on like this or this. The work, if, you, if you're honest about it, if you're passionate about it, it's going to turn into your own. It has to. Otherwise, I don't think students in this school would even have that problem. You know, otherwise you wouldn't even be sitting in this room now. Sure. You know, if you Thank you so much. Copy somebody. Um, B, do you have your hand up? Yeah, so like, um, that's like for you to compile your textbook. I mean, it seems like a huge undertaking and so tedious and, you know, many re revisions i i would think so well, you know take you that that was you know the hardest part of that i'm going to tell you i the first edition was 1993 and professor tane wrote her book in 1993 and i remember when we were leaving fairchild they said to us um and <laughs> you 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 know how to to work this on a computer right uh, yeah, and I just shook my head. Ah, and then I, said, <laughs> I, I, then when I left, I said to Linda, I can't do this book. I said, well, I'll probably type it, and then I'll give it to someone to put in it. That was the scariest part of doing the book. But once I learned basic, and I mean basic, because I type, so I'm typing. You know, I did once lose a whole chapter because I forgot to save it. But what I was doing as I was writing the book, I was just talking my lessons out loud and um i was pretending i i didn't i didn't record it i had no notes i pretended that i was in the classroom and i said okay today's lesson is about and i was actually talking it through and typing it out at the same time and you know i've been by the time i wrote my textbook i was teaching over 25 years i would put x's where i knew a drawing had to go and Slowly but surely, it happened. I had some great editors to work with. And the first one was the hardest. Um, and I'm glad it was the first one because you don't really know how much work it's going to be. The second one was a little bit of an of, uh, there were more chapters added. The third one had more color. But the final one was 50% redone because in 20 years, since 1993 or 25 years, the style of even the clothing I was illustrating for, for the lessons, the style changed. But that was a very different, that was a part of my career I put on another table because it involved the teaching years and it involved the professional years and it involved a lot of things. And um, 
it was an undertaking, but I loved it. Now, when I saw the book finished, I said, oh, my God, how did I ever do it? But while I was doing it, I really enjoyed it so much. I don't want to do another one. But that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Sandra Marcus, did you have a question? Yeah. Oh. So, hi, Stephen. Hi. Um, so I'm not I'm not going to turn my video on. So thank you. This is really amazing, and and it's a, a bright spot of my day. Um, one of your qualities as a teacher um, that I respect immensely is your ability to support students' development of their own style and voice. Could you talk a little bit about how you help students? And you used the word before, find their own vision. Well, and not but, impose um, your own. Well, that's my definition of a good professor. So let's start with that one. A good professor. Okay, I'm in a classroom with 25 people. I do a lesson. That's the easiest part because that's more how to. But once that lesson is over, it is my job to get into 25 people's heads, not to get 25 people into my head. And if they see this way, I have to see this way. If they see that way, and we discuss things. It's not, I like this. I'll ask them, I always start off, what do you like? And they go, what do you like? I said, it's not my project. So we start with what you like, then we talk about it. And maybe red would be a better choice than purple. But the joy of teaching is that. I mean, when, when I see finished projects and all of them look like they came from another planet i'm so happy if they all looked like they came out of my class i wouldn't be teaching thanks okay um manoha pierre jerome <clears throat> hi hi okay so with body diversity becoming a huge thing do you think moving forward um fashion will have more body positive body um figures going on because right now we have those slick models that we keep on drawing. <laughs> Believe it or not, your question was a question that went back from the first days I taught. But now the world is different and we have a million uh, definitions of what beautiful is. So what when you're drawing a fashion figure that you're learning in school, it has no ethnicity. It has no kind of body type. It's just a classic fashion figure with a classic fashion proportion. It's like learning the letters of an alphabet. As time goes on and your work gets better because you know you you need to have more skills. Body, t I think in a in a. I, first of all, I think it's happening now. D drawing different kind of body types will not be the issue. One of my favorite jobs that I ever had was, oh, it had to be in the late 80s. It was for Simplicity Patterns, and they were large size. Uh, it was a large size collection, but not large size like 16, 18. I mean, they went up and up and up and up. And I remember the it's still a fashion does every you know the the model still has to have a good looking head there's a thousand definitions of what that is they still have to have a body that's in proportion they still have to have the arms still end at the same place no matter what body type you have the eyes are still in the same place um but i think this is becoming a norm and i think it's it's something that will happen because it's happening and it has to happen but but if you understand the one you're learning in school and just step away from that a little bit that's just the basic the basic recipe and once you know the basic recipe it's like cooking ask a good cook for a recipe and they say i don't know i pour a little bit in and i pour a little bit of this but once you learn that the other becomes personal and the body type will work if it's something you want to make work but it won't look like a cartoon because you're going to have the substance you know behind it I, it has to happen there's not a question about that thank you okay let's take one more question for right now and then we'll go go back to your pictures um son i think you have your hand up Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay. The first question is, uh, is uh, um, uh, the fashion industry is growing very fast right now, and the competition is intense, and the uh, opportunities are few. So what do you think of the fashion industry uh, today? What you just said to me is exactly what my teacher said to me. <laughs> the same exact thing a million years ago. The fashion industry is changing, the opportunity is getting. Just, you know what, this is it. If you really want to do this, and you really have the passion to do this, somehow it works. Somehow it works. Um, don't think of that. That's too negative. Fashion changes. The fashion world you're in has nothing to do with the one I was in. The one I had was in had nothing to do with what two generations before was in. But you're trained for this world. So it's not like they're waking me up one morning after sleeping 40 years and throwing me in this world. And I'm like, Bleh. you're trained for this world. And rather than don't think of it that way. You know, the world, there's enough negativity going on. Just think positively. It, you have a talent, you have a skill, you have a passion. If you really, if it matters to you that much and it's so important to you, it'll work. But you have to remember one thing. Fashion has so many branches that it's so, when you're in school now, you're only in your major. Once you hit the world, there's 10,000 other parts. So you could be showing me a portfolio and <clears throat> I'm gonna tell my classes. And I could say, oh gee, I like the shoes on your figures. And then you go, oh, I always like to draw shoes. And then I go, you know, I have a friend who you might want to contact. Well, from learning women's fashions or men's fashions, you might become the greatest shoe designer. There's so many branches of this. There are so many branches of this. There are so many successful people were a buyer, then they became a designer. They were an illustrator, they became a designer. They were a designer, they be It's not as limited as you think it is. And I just wanna add one thing to the question before. Like when you learn how to draw a face, okay, before you could draw ethnicity, you have to know where the eyes, nose, and mouth goes because every ethnicity, it goes in the same place. So once you learn that, the rest just happens. Okay. Okay, thank you. Awesome. All right, thank so you. I broke it down into parts. So now I'm gonna need your help to just let me know if you could see it clearly. Yeah. So I, I went back, Women's Wear Daily, this is what a cover looked like. So I took a few from every decade and this was, um, Back it up a little, maybe, yeah. Wow. Better? Okay, this was one, as you, you could see by the headline, it says Mini Maxi. And this is the one where the big headline change started to happen. And I approached it very, very graphically, and I did it with a bold marker. And to answer the previous question about techniques, I really don't know if I could work this way anymore because the energy that this period of my life had is a different energy now. And that's what I was talking about being open to change. This is one, this is when I actually did when I was in Paris and it was an advance at Pierre Cardin. And back, this, a little bit, back it up a little bit. There we go. Okay, and this is this is what a cover looked like. And I remember they said, you have an appointment at Pierre Cardin, the model will show you a coat, it has to go for tomorrow. I go in for my appointment, the model has a sheet, opens it, one, two, three, she's gone. <laughs> okay, and that was, that. so that was a very fast sketch. This was a sketch, these are all from the, going into the 70s. This was a sketch from an actual garment. This was James Galanos, and when he brought the collection to New York, I saw the show, and then this was done from a photograph. But all of these, this is what the covers of Women's Wear looked like. And my style changed. You know, what was interesting is I brought, uh, to answer your question, the world before me was a world that was fantasy. 
Balenciaga and all those gorgeous women. The world I was in was micro mini skirts. The whole thing was to bring your own energy. I always tell my class, you only have this energy once in your life because every year it changes. And when I was in my early 20s, I had the energy to capture that moment, you know, of the clothes. I can't do this anymore, even if I try to, because I'm not in my early 20s and fashion doesn't look like that. So these are just different techniques. So this is what women's wear looked like in the, um, into the 70s and, um, and the covers. Back, back, and, back up just a bit. Go with that. Good? More? Yeah. Okay. And this is what the covers looked like. Yeah. And I oh, exper uh, what? No, I'll have that. I experimented a lot more than I did experiment more than and the much more graphic things that I do now. And probably people are not that familiar with this period of mine. You're gonna see them change as the time periods change. And that was the East Saint Laurent Paris, um, Paris drawing. Now we're getting into maybe 1972. Um, I'm gonna show you the exact opposite, taking place the same year, a Ralph Lauren. So you see how I had to adapt to the look of the designer as well. And no matter what area of fashion, of fashion you're in, you have to adapt to the company you're working for. I mean, so, and then sometimes this was a more, this was an Aurel advance and it was a little more classic. And now you're gonna see as time goes on and we kind of get in to the middle 70s, you're gonna see the work change. Now we have spot color, which was new. We were allowed to have one color overlay. And I worked very graphically then. Okay, now we approach the 80s. Well, the type of women's, the logo got bigger, <laughs> the shoulders got bigger. And these were advances. I think this one is a Donna Karen. And you see, I had to go for the exaggeration of the shoulder. So again, back to that question, you learn the basic fashion figure. Clothes change it all the time. So it's constantly changing. And sometimes it was just like, it, it was upside just, down. sometimes it was just a very inexpensive. That one's upside down. Oh, okay. Sometimes it was just a very inexpensive oh. romper or something, but maybe a bestseller. I mean, these were the different levels of it. So I'll show you three Calvin Klein ones from that decade. This was one of them. And they would have a headline where Calvin's high tea and it was a t-shirt dress. And then later on, obviously into the big shoulders. So these are three drawings from the um, 1980s, that, that decade of the same designer. But the approach that I had taken every one of the three was a very different one. Sometimes I painted it. But if you look at the work, this does not look like the early work I did because I'm different age, the time is different, my skills are better or different. And that's what the whole thing is about. It's about just like live in the moment and just react to the moment. And it was just, well, we had to go for the shape. And these were the headlines, head like in the swing. Yeah, there's, there's, you can see the movement in everything that you've held up, even even with the evolving. Um... And this was the last 
I was always there for the last one. Okay, this was the last Paris collections that were covered by artwork. And I have a full color one from W. This was just Chanel Advance, pretty much when Lagerfeld began there. And after this, now we're up to 1991. And here's where the big change started to happen. Because what started to happen then, the, some of the designers were becoming like movie stars. And some of them were, you know, they were very good looking, like um, Halston, like um, Calvin Klein, like Nora Kamali, like Beth Diane von Furstenberg. And they wanted to be photographed as well. So they began to be photographed with their clothes. And the drawings from about that time, as, as I knew it, turned into something else. This was more of an editorial page that was the loosest work and the freest work that, that I've done. These were inside pages. And here would be the definitive 1987 <laughs> big shoulder in far. And, far, yeah. and then I did the last cover of Women's Square when it was printed in paper and it had six inside pages. I think my friend Andrew's on the thing. He was the art director. And this was 19, it was 2000, I can't see, 2001 or so, or, no, let me get the year. 2014, and it was a Valentino. And it was, um, it was the cover, and it had about six pages inside. It was called Tabletop Dressing. Lower it just a little bit. And this was the last printed piece in Women's Wear wow. before they went online. So let me go back. Does anyone have any questions? Because we're okay with time. I'd be able to do it. Anybody have any questions about this so far? No? Yes, there are questions out there. Sun Meng has another question. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, I have a question. Is uh, I'm really love your uh, sketching style, and uh, but uh, how to firm or establish my own sketching uh, style? I could. I can hear. It okay, right. I say again. It's uh, uh, I mean, so it's, uh, how to firm or establish my own sketching style? Let I it happen. <laughs> Just let it happen. It will not happen at the end of the semester. You get better at it. Remember when you were six years old and you learned the alphabet? Uh, yeah. When you write now, you don't say the letters. It just happens, time is what does it. So you can only be as good as you are right now. Three years later, you'll be better. Five years later, you'll be better. 10 years later, you'll be better. Three months, you'll be better. You can't let that be an issue. Mm -hmm. If you're serious about it, it will happen. Okay, I understand. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh oh. Keep going. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. Thanks, Renata. Hi, Professor Stippleman. Oh, this I is one of my worst students ever. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, Stephen, first of all, I just wanted to thank you for. Uh, this so eloquent and uh, uh, amazing uh, conversation you just had. I gave um, him an A. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but my, my, my question to you is um, going back to you mentioning um, the use of uh, computer generated illustrations. Um, as far as <clears throat> Uh, you, I, I know we've talked about, you know, say students maybe drawing a head and reusing that head for about 20 times. Um, how do you feel about just having like pieces of a drawing and that cut and paste method? It has no emotion. And I, I really think this is one of the negative things. You do get the job done quicker, but like pretend you don't have a computer, then you'd have to draw them. And 
I when I when I said work on a computer, you know, you know, like Josie Vargas or Professor Vargas. I mean, it's like your hand is rendering. You, the computer is not doing anything. But I think a lot of what the computer is doing now is causing cookie cutter work where you have the figures with that same head on top of it or even worse a photograph from a magazine plopped on top of each head and then they all look the same because w that's very negative because they all look the same so when you're looking at 20 of them they, one doesn't even look better so if 20 people go on an interview you can't even remember anyone you, your hand is what you do it the computer is an art supply okay and thank you so much that, that's it yeah. it doesn't re it's like a sewing machine it doesn't make a beautiful dress unless you're not a sew <laughs> true thank you a uh, great comment in a chat room um from wilder jean gardner about um, when she designed in the industry how the sales staff always hoped you would draw the editorials that women's wear daily for their company because they booked big sales from your illustrations at major market weeks across the country which is which is really a very neat feature as a, a a former salesperson myself i i think to have an illustration in the showroom would have been such a great tool to sell more products you know speaking of professor gardner um she's always said something that's very interesting see my world did not grow up with a computer and probably anyone that was a student up to 1993 or four really didn't so the computer was something very like interesting to me because it 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 it's something that was from another world but if you are looking for work now and hildy you'll hear what i'm saying if you're looking for work now you have to remember you're going to be showing this work to people who grew up with computer generated art so if they see hand art, that's going to look really interesting to them it's like a turn you know they're going to go oh wow you drew that because they're not used to seeing it but if you're going to bring up drawings with glued on heads i'm sorry like i said before 10 people show me work i don't remember any of it yeah <laughs> are there any more questions in the crowd well before we move on yeah all right um Steve, do you have more that you wanted to show yeah, I have, um, I could go, what time is it? I have a lot. Yeah, keep going, please. Yeah, no. Uh, okay, now I want to show you some, these are the double page spreads. So these were usually on a trend, okay? And this one, let me, I don't even know the year of this. I don't even want to know the year of it. Let's say it was the late 60s and it was about, could you see it? Yeah, maybe a little high, just a little bit lower. There we go. It was about skirt length. And everyone, and I love to draw crop figures. <laughs> and notice it's crop, but the top is cropped. And it's all about the legs because the skirt lengths were what was going on there. So, so, so what they would do, because it was a publication, is they would come up with um, what the trend was. And that was skirts on the move. Then we would do things like bestseller. And this, this is now the very late 60s, maybe 69. And this was, this already, I would have photographs because the store now would send in photographs of what was selling, but it was Pia Cardin and I took a very graphic approach to it. And this was one of my most difficult jobs in the world ever. This was markdowns, okay. So now imagine this, I don't know, I'm still young, okay. So I have to go to these really fancy stores like Bergdorf's and Baumwitz and Saks. Okay, a young male, okay? It's not the world we look in now. And I have to pilfer through all the markdowns and see what was marked down and sketch it. <laughs> I had to remember this. And wow. then every, I could remember five at a time, then I had to run to the bathroom to sketch it. Then I'd come back. Because I couldn't do it there. And I love this. These were the clothes that didn't sell. And it was, I, I wish they did things like that now. Daily, or this was a project you would do for something? No, this was women's wear. They did this for a while and then they stopped it. Because I think 
they would yeah. lose that they would lose advertising if they said they closed didn't sell yeah it, it would just say like even with the ones like norman norell who was the god of fashion they'd say we're doing very well with norell spring clothes but we're having we're trying hard to sell the fall so yeah. that was just more reporting but it's and interesting i mean as a as a you know someone in the industry you you go shop those markdown racks a lot as a as a person in the brand side trying to figure out what your competitors are doing well with and not doing well with and for someone to give you that information would be pretty nice <laughs> um this was a more formal one this was after a galano show and this was my, one of my favorite times because i always got could you see it? Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. I always got to cover his collection, and that was, I think, the most beautiful collection I've ever seen in my life. And um, we'd meet with him. He'd come from California, and I'd actually get a chance. He would, We'd see the clothes on a model, and then I'd go back to more formal drawing and then, then get invited to the show. And it was one of the first times I could watch it, and I didn't have to work. And then... Um, color came in oh, beautiful. And, and the color was a little crude then and yeah. then what yeah. would happen see the whole thing we had to combine many designers clothes and it's not like one designer the themes were a little bit different but they would pick up like this was the blues on waist but you know there were a lot of price points here there were designer there were more bridge they were more young, they were more older, and we had to work it in a in a in one shot. So all of these figures are not photoshopped and put together. They're all done on one piece of paper. And here's another one. This one was Bill Blass. Um this is all Bill Blass. You can tell from here. <laughs> what? Reading the headline, you can tell it's Bill Blass. Yeah. And these were done from um existing clothes like here we'd go up to the showroom and i would actually see the clothing and see it on a model and then i, I would have, have a question yes yes sorry, i have a question oh with the i'm sorry <laughs> he's my with friend last, it's okay uh, you know with the last uh layout with the blues on yes where you, where you said you had different price points yeah from designer to bridge to young yes okay would would you already have a layout of what no. figure or what not not for this was we dominant had to do the, or we had to okay. do the whole thing we had to do the whole thing so and, so so you would lay them out according to how you saw it yeah i mean unfortunately none of these labels are still there anymore but it would be you could have it could have been an oscar de la renta and it could have been a betsy johnson and it right. could have been it could have been markets that were not the same. So we would have to just go for the look. And then just, I don't know, you just learned how to put it together where, you know, where they worked. I can't even answer that that question. You know, it's like, okay. no, I was just always curious about that. That was hard to do. No, they didn't give us layouts, no. And here, with, this was a little bit easier because this was in advance. But here, every designer is boxed off separately. So they would come from sketches. It looks, it looks a lot like how women's wear prints now. It's just that now they're photographs versus. Yeah, you wouldn't get, you wouldn't have the photographs now. You yeah. wouldn't have the artwork now. And this one was a story on like night sweaters. You know, so they'd come up with the theme we would get this in the morning and it would have to be done by the end of the day. Wow. You know, rarely. My, I never, maybe other artists there did, but I, I never, I was given the stuff that had to be done two minutes after they gave it to me. And that was what I loved. I loved it because it made me react. It's like, here are these clothes, react, <laughs> like just react. It's like, it's like putting a, a, a match under your hand and you go like that just react you know there's two ways of working you know like a lot of people work more intellectually i don't it's and no one's not right and one's not wrong I, and i i i marvel at the ones that do
because it's something that is very hard for me to do. So I work very reactive. So if I laid down the designer's uh, sketches and I saw little fabric swatches, I don't know, it's like I could close my eyes and just, it, that, was what, that was my skill. Everyone had other skills. Like, you know, I was not good at drawing accessories or it wasn't my thing. I like to draw, I like to draw clothes. I hated to draw swimsuits, even though I had to. Um, and I liked to draw with the less knowledge I had. I found that so fascinating, the less I know about these clothes. And the other part we did was cosmetics. I did a lot of that. And this was, um, I think my friend Andrew is here and he was art director for some of this. Um, this was, what? It's gorgeous. Oh, I thought you called it. And this was the Saint Laurent makeup and the face was based on the colors of the season. And then we picked a garment. And I remember on this one, the day this before this is running, a new collection was shown. So I had to cut this out and do a new dress you know, for the, from the current collection. And, and, um, Julie Maz Mazinski is- Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, Lord. Hi, Stephen. Hi, Julie. I'm gonna ask you, since you um, were just talking about this, like how, uh, how much work did you do with the art directors and how many of them made you crazy, like ha having to make changes since- you know, Oh, like editors made me crazy. Yeah. <laughs> The so editors like today, everyone has computers and they're like, we want it, it's blue, we want it pink, we want it this way, we want it that way. Yeah. Oh, that went on. Yeah. But it was usually, see, at Women's Wear, the, I, we worked with the art director. So it was, that was never the issue. But then the editor would look at it and depending on their level of intelligence, um, they'd have things to say. But we had a very protective art director. And um, he... <laughs> he would come in and fight for us a little bit. In any creative profession, 87 people are gonna give you their opinion. But I worked through a period of the skirt length change from mini to maxi. And when I had a job to do, they would go, you know, make it short, but not like really short because, you know, so I began to understand that babble, you know, of like, make it short, but remember it's getting longer or make it fitted, but you know, not that fitted. and. It was, I was able to understand these bizarre languages of, right. of these people that made no sense. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. And this was um, not at the beginning. At the beginning, I would cry when I had to fix something. This was an accessories cover. These were section covers. These were the cover pages of sections. And for the covers, we had a little bit more time, you know. And... This was a beauty, a beauty. Uh, Gina, did you have a question? Yes. Hi, Professor. Hello. <laughs> um, so speaking of people being um, like not specific in their language, I remember in class one time you talked about um, a woman that was trying to describe a coat and she was just kind of she was saying, oh, there's buttons here and there. And I just remember you telling us how she had I was, the vaguest description of a coat and somehow it, you know, you made it work and she loved it. This was, um, it's a funny story. It was um, the first time. Women's Wear was never allowed at Balenciaga. There was always fights or something. So this was the first time I had to meet with a buyer. And it was like, I discovered there's another language here that we don't learn in school. And I had to meet with this buyer and she was going to describe a coat from the collection. And I took out my paper and I'm ready. And all she's going is, um, oh, it was the most divine collection. And after saying the word divine 400 times, I had to say, so what did the coat look like? And she would do the whole thing with her hand, a marvelous little shape. And I would just watch her hand and draw what she was doing on her body. And then she would go, you know, one of those marvelous little Balenciaga collars, you know, the way they turn. And it had all these delicious little ball buttons. And it was language like that. And I, after a while, I began to speak it. <laughs> and I kind of knew what they were talking about. Are we there? Thank you so much. I yeah. love that story. <laughs> you learn, but not from day one. So see, this was the cover 
of the section, which I had, but then we had a lot of inside things like um, a ton of inside drawings, you know, which had to be done very fast and they were done with marker. And a lot of them were fabric sections. So we would, I would do a kind of trend of the moment. This is an acrylic and that's what I, these were the, this is the work I think most people remember me from is these acrylic paintings. Um, this is like a completely junky dress, but your job is to make it not look, you got to make it look like it's not. And then women's wear was, um, uh, this is something from W. And it was, they took all these blonde girls with the long straight blonde hair, and they wanted to know what would happen if they changed the way they wore their hair. So I had to do portraits of them. And it was a little sketch. I had to do portraits of them and a little designer sketch from the hairdresser. And it was, you know, these were the, like the socialites, the young socialites of their time who were all 70 now. <laughs> And it was very hard to do this because they were all known for their hairstyle, like the way Anna Winter is. And now you have to draw them completely different. None of them took it. None of them followed this. But it was a story on how the hairdressers would see them. Okay. And this one was in W. And this was the, oh, let me show you a little of that. Then I'll show you some more. These are what pages in W look like. Like big blown up drawings. This is for Ray. These were done from designer croquis. I never saw these clothes. And this is um, this is for this is for Sachi. It's, it's kind of hard to tell. Is that picture of Versace? Yes, yes, yes. Real? It's a photograph of the designer. Yeah. yeah. And this was the big stuff. And then there was black and white ones inside. And you really got to, you got to go for the big picture. And this was the last, I showed you the cover of that Chanel. This was the last W, a collection drawing. And this one is one of my favorite ones. I never saw any of these clothes ever. And they were just from a designer sketch and sometimes a description of the fabric, not even the fabric. And I had to draw them all like I was there. But this time, I, this was towards the end. So here I was pretty 99.99% accurate. <laughs> <laughs> and this was the last. Um, and this final thing I'm going to show you, I'll take some questions. I have some of the portraits, which are very interesting too. But you know, there was a teasing about, like, when you saw drawings of the clothes, you really didn't see the clothes. And it was like, I wonder what they're going to look like. I wonder what they're going to look like. There's no wondering anymore. The show's over. You see it. And Zara's done it. <laughs> Different Anybody, era. Anybody have a question? I have a question yeah. from one of our foreign students who's not here. Um, <clears throat> no. Uh, she asked... Um, uh, if you could change something in the fashion world, what would it be? Yikes. <laughs> okay. Yes. I have an answer. I have an answer. Even though it's <laughs> make the clothing look better. Okay. Okay. But this goes back to, that's Professor Gardner and the one that's not letting me alone is Professor Barnetti, who's one of my good friends. Sometimes Barnetti and I say, like, can't we just have clothes that look good? Because I think we've gotten, it's a two part answer. We've gotten so much into the word concept, like that I think it's gonna bring us down. I really do. Like it gets so conceptual with 14 pages and all this writing and all this analyzing to design a coat. And I think, Everything is a concept. If I say we're going to do a t-shirt collection, it's going to be a concept because yours might be tight, another one might be big, yours might be neon, another one might be neutral. I think the concepts have overridden the clothes now.
And I think we're seeing fashion shows that are so composed of clothes that are never going to go to the store. And then we see red carpet of uh. clothes they borrowed. Now they get paid for wearing it. These are clothes that could have a 50 foot train. They're not going anywhere. And I think for a young student, this is very confusing because yeah. you're telling them one thing and they're giving you 50 examples of, of what happens, but Kim Kardashian is not what we should be studying. The other part is I don't think fashion designers are given a chance. And this is really, I don't think anyone is given a chance. It's got, when I was talking about deadlines, I meant physical deadline, but you have fashion designers now having to oversee so many collections and so many parts of a collection and they don't get a chance to grow. So if we look at the most brilliant fashion designers of the past, you know, like let's start with even Dior, Balenciaga. They had season after season Chanel had 50 years of it to evolve a point of view. Now they have one collection to create a point of view. If it doesn't sell, they're out. This is really bad. And I think that it's bad for everyone. It's bad for the creative people. It's hurting the business. It's like you, you, it's got to come back a little bit more reality based. People, your concept could be chandeliers in Versailles, but people will not wear a glass dress with light bulbs. You know, and I think we've gotten so far into this now that we gotta we gotta go back a little bit and yeah. just start doing beautiful clothes. Do you have a question? Well, uh, I have another one from one of my students abroad. Um, Janisha Shaw asked, um, with all the exposure. <clears throat> you had through, over the years, have you ever considered starting your own design label it yourself? Have I ever what? Started, thought about designing a label yourself. Actually, being of a designer. Oh, that's what I wanted to be. And I went to music and art art school and it was a special, it's now, um, now the high school, LaGuardia now. And I wanted to be a fashion designer, but I was a fine arts major. And when, I told my teachers that I wanted to be in fashion. My painting teachers is like telling your mother you want to be a drug dealer. And I think I got so nervous that I said, okay, I'll draw it. Because <laughs> I like that too. But yeah, there's a part of me that would have liked to be a designer. I think there's a part of everyone that would like to have been something else. But Did you ever consider it throughout your career? Like one, or, one, or two, one or two times early on and um, I don't know, I think you're destined to be, you know, to somewhere, I don't know. Yeah. I, it didn't happen. I have no regrets of anything. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, another one from Ashni Tulsian. Um, what do you feel like the biggest challenges that you face throughout your career as an illustrator are? Well, the work ones were a lot when I never saw clothes. And um, when, when Princess Carolyn from, Mo uh, from Monaco, Grace Kelly's daughter, when she got married, I drew the dress because we had a phone conversation with the House of Dior in Paris, and they were describing it. And um, I'll talk about that when I see the next groups. My gr the, great the greatest challenge professionally, I think the... the I'll, I'll, I'll do it a little bit a different way. I think the greatest challenge was not in the physical work itself because that's what I was trained to do. The greatest challenge was learning that everything you do will not be perfect. And I think that's the big, that's a class student should have, okay? A, there's no such word as perfect. And that not everything could meet we try to meet the highest level that we could meet. But if I'm doing 10 sketches, I cannot like them all the same. One is yeah. gonna be my favorite. And I think when I first began, it was like being a student and I get what students are, cause I was that. If they all weren't perfect in my head, it was, I couldn't bear it, I couldn't bear it. And then when I think, when you get good at your craft and you get good at what you're doing. So if I were to do 50 drawings now, 
yeah, I've worked a long time. Technically, they could, they'll all look fine. They'll all look fine. So if I showed them to someone, they'd all look fine. Out of those 50, I would probably like half of them. Out of the, that half, I could love four of them. And then two will be my favorite. And the other half will meet the high standards, but they're not going to always exceed the standard, like grading. But when you're a student, it's a very hard thing. And I think that was the greatest challenge to learn. My work, work gets better as you do it. That's all. It just gets better. And, you, you know, I got fired. We all get fired. I think it's good to get fired. You can check it off your list and move on. And, um, you know, you get fired, it's the end of the world. You're not having any more career. We all go through that. I remember all this as I've, I was the age of the students right here. But it's learning to accept that you have to, you have to meet a deadline and ease up. You can only be the best you could, you know, on, on, the, on the big picture. Is that a question in the upper left from um, someone named Andrew Flynn? No. Never. Is there another question? Uh, Shriya Kardat had, had written me a question, but I see she's on now. I don't know if you want to ask that, Shriya. Go ahead. Um, okay, well, then I will ask one of her questions for her. Um, According to you, what is the future of fashion illustration? Uh, you know, <laughs> that's the question that it's like, like you know, like what's the future of the world? <laughs> yeah, who would have thought we'd be doing what we're doing right now today, like two weeks oh, ago? Oh, you want my biggest challenge? <laughs> my biggest challenge in my whole life was my lesson this morning online <laughs> okay that was my biggest challenge okay this would have been but you fixed it okay the, the 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 fashion illustration first of all okay when i was a student okay you still had well it was a major a complete major and it was a profession and it was a profession a, a, a legitimate profession that you could really work in until maybe the beginning of the 90s then it started easing off um but what happened then a fashion design student did not have to draw that well they had to be okay because there was always the fashion illustration student that could draw it for them so i think what we did now is make the fashion i think that fashion design students now i think a lot of them if they were from my time probably would have gone into fashion illustration. Into fashion illustration. Just, just like I would have gone, like into fashion, would have gone into fashion, to fashion design. So I think that fashion illustration now has shifted a lot to the designer. They have to have much more drawing skills. And some of the fashion, some of the fashion design students I, I have, have brilliant illustration skills. I mean, brilliant, brilliant compared to people I saw in my whole life. So I think things just fall into different places. Like, like we don't have the sample rooms anymore. Does that mean you can't, you don't have to know how to drape? No, you have to know how to drape. It one, you know, there were no, there were no overseas manufacturing when I started to work. It'll never end. Nothing ends. It falls into different places that have different needs. And, you know, and when people ask me, do you think it was nicer when you worked? I was younger. It was it was the beginning of a career. It was a very different time. I thought it was fabulous. But do I think it was nicer? Parts of it were, but parts of now are nicer. You know, I don't, it, it changes. It has to change. Great, thank you. Any other questions out there? I feel like people would probably like to see, keep seeing work if you have some to share, but also I don't want to take up too much of your time. Well, no, now I'm just going to go through the portrait part, which is another part that I love to do. Is there a question? Oh, here comes uh, Pan. Another one. Yes. <laughs> Where did he's it go? My, he's, oh, these are my friends. I'm not, I'm not being nasty to them. Okay. Ronaldo, uh, Ronaldo, do you have a question? 
No, I, I, I hit something by mistake. I'm fine. I'm just, I'm just listening. I'm sorry. Okay. That's okay. Okay. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go back to your um, portraits. Okay. So my, the, the, I loved, this was a part I really loved doing. So I explained it a little bit earlier and now I'll go into it a little bit more. I think I had gone through a lot of parties, you know, in, in my years there. And sometimes I just had to draw the atmosphere of the party. But in 10 lifetimes, I could never have gone to all the parties I drew. And it was like, I used to love, especially when people that were not my favorite people in the world would think I would go to all these places and I would never tell them the truth. But basically, here is an example, and I'm going to show you a layout. Okay, this happened to be an accident. Okay. I was in Paris during the summer of God knows what year, and the play Coco was coming out on Broadway about Chanel. So I was there and they were doing a story. So they called me and they just said, you know, if you go to Chanel, they'll show you some sketch, some, some suits, and that's what they're gonna work into the play. So I did just quick little rough sketches. So it all started out where the, there had to be portraits of Catherine Hepburn. Okay, so each one was done like this. I did this when I came back to New York. It was a, a little bit of an advance. So I had photographs of her. I had the suit, and there were one. There were four drawings in the layout, and each one was on a a single drawing. Now, before Photoshop, this was the layout. Wait, let me. This was what a layout was. They made photocopies of all the art. They glued it together on a board. You could see. Wow. It's been glued together. Um, they had a photograph of Chanel. Those were my portraits of Catherine Hepburn. And whoever asked the layout question before, the, it was working with the art director in the sense that here, where it says notch, is where all the copy was going to go. But this is what a layout did. Looked like on every single page of every fashion magazine, you know, was hand done with rubber cement, you know, and, and you know, done like this. And then it would go to a printer. The printer would pick it up and here's one. These were the wedding bell. This must have been for Princess Diana's wedding. And I love this time. It was just running from one designer to another and getting their idea of what the dress looked like. Sometimes I'd send in a drawing of what the dress would look like. And then um, then putting, doing a portrait of the woman in the dress. But there was one woman in one of the, I don't know, one, one, one of these spreads that I had to do. There was a woman that was a little bit more obscure and they couldn't find a portrait, a photograph of her, but they knew she had blonde hair. So I had to kind of do a pose and only show the blonde hair. And this was um, <clears throat> this was some one I liked. This was we spent the day with Kenneth J. Lane in his house, and it was doing. They did an extensive interview on, and I actually did. I didn't do this completely there, but I started to sketch it there in his house, and this was a full page in W. Yeah. You know, that was a very special one. Here's one of 10,000 Jackie Onassis ones. And this is where, that's what the cut page of women's will look like. And it was a Valentino code again. And I think it was Valentino. Yeah. Yeah, so that was part of it. And then what happened after that there was a store on, on Park Avenue. This was a really scary one for me to do because this, these were ladies that um, were a lot of them older than my grandmother. And they, it, it was this very fancy store on Park Avenue called Martha. And it was on the corner of 58th and Park. And, that, and she had brought the Valentino Couture collection over there. And that store was so fancy that it's like you couldn't walk in it. And I had to go in. 
and they gave me, it was one, two, three, six. There was six, well, the cover and six other dresses. And they told me which lady bought it. And it was all white. That whole place was white and crystal. And I don't, I was terrified to draw even in there. So I did the sketches of there of all the Valentino dresses and I saw them. And then when I came back, I did all the portraits of the women in them. And I think I had two days for this. And these ladies were what Truman Capote, most of them refer to as the swans, Bay Paley and Gloria Gaines and Jackie. And it was like, I, I really, this was very nostalgic to me because this, this piece of work was um, recreating my fantasy life as a child. You know, these women, I was drawing their granddaughters at this point and I could have been their grandson. So it was a little bit, it was, it was very nice. I liked it. And this is um, one of Nancy Reagan. Um, I don't know where she was going here. I think it was to Prince Charles's wedding. And it was the Galanos thing she wore. And this is another Jackie. I mean, 50 million of hers. I mean, she was probably the the biggest style setter of my period, you know, was her. And everything she bought. Oh, this was the cover of the one from, Val from the Valentinos. This was the cover. And that was pretty much an overview of the pockets that my work went into. So anyone have any more questions or? Ronaldo question? <laughs> <laughs> no more questions. Thank you. This was really, really entertaining and uh, informative. I enjoyed it. I want to um, just make a shout out and say we had at one point we had 85 people in this and there's this is a class of only 50 and half not half but about 15 are abroad and not able to join for the 24 hour time change. So um, really a lot of great guests that were here today and we're here every week for 10 um, with different lectures. I flashed the schedule at the beginning but I'll flash it for you all again now. Um, if you feel like coming back again now that we're all, we're all cooped up at home and we're all looking for new things to do. Um, and if you're not a member of my Facebook group, please, please do join us Faces and Places on Facebook and you can, you can follow along with who, who will be here. Um, but Professor Sibelman, it has been amazing having you. This was a really cool way to kick off the remote learning with this um, really beautiful eye candy. So thank you so much for um, for coming on today. I appreciate it, was, it. It was my pleasure. I mean, it was one. I hope it was just one moment of getting out of the news. <laughs> we all we all needed that. <laughs> okay. Um, there was just two, a question that popped up. Um, yeah. Will there be a recorded one? Yes, this is recorded, and it, um, I, I'm intending to actually post it after the fact on Facebook this time around. Since it was our first go, I wanted to record first, post later. So um, for anyone who wants to board along, it'll be out there. Well, uh, thank you. This was quite a thing for me. I feel so technologically brilliant. <laughs> you know? It, it was also nice just it was it was interesting as I was doing this um it was bringing back a lot of moments of my you know of my professional life you know and I mean some of the people I know Donna is here I worked with her Andrew Flynn was the art director I worked with him I worked with fabulous artists I still do um but it, <laughs> it was it was very interesting looking it was like looking at a time capsule but I just up in your New York City apartment. Yeah, you know. It's impressive. But, You've been in good shape. It's just not. But if if anything, it's just don't lock yourself up, and and like say, uh, this was this is my style. This is what I'm. You're 17, 18, 19, 20. That would be so pathetic. What are you gonna do with 80? You know, you have to keep growing, and you and I never get. I, the one thing I'm happy about myself is that I never go, I wish it were, because you can't. It's just, it changes. Yeah, those brought back very happy um, moments and times in my life. 
because I remember the situations that were taking place then. But um, it's still exciting, but it's different. It's just different. Nothing ends. People always need clothes. And you always have to record clothes. So it'll turn into something else. Right now, people need pajama pants. So okay. Someone better be designed to pajama pants. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, okay. for joining us. And um, stay healthy and happy. Okay. What do I do now? Just just X out, I believe. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs>